Uh, Eve Johnson-Horton and David Yates for these eight talking points today in a bumper edition. Eve, you were very cross earlier in the week. Tell me why. Well, I wasn't cross. I merely stated that five days out before our classics, um, the Racing Post had the first six pages was purely on Punchestown. In fact, there was only one very small article about cachet in, in the, at all, and that was on the Tuesday before the Guineas. I'm not saying we shouldn't have Punchestown on the, in the paper. I know that jumping is great and everyone's very heavily invested in it, the general public, but actually we need to then be shifting the focus more. Um, Punchestown, the final great jumps festival of the season, jumping sells the Racing Post as it sells all other racing media organisations. That's simply the, the truth at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, but if you want to sell flat racing, then why not integrate it more whilst you, you're getting the sales in? Make more stories. It's not rocket science, is it? From a journalist's perspective then, Dave? Um, I think that it's definitely true that in terms of our, our biggest spikes in circulation are certainly the Cheltenham Festival and Grand, you know, Grand National Day is the, is the tabloid's biggest mm. selling day of the year. Of Incre incredibly, you know, that's the, the, the <coughs> out of all, Still every amazing. day, yeah, mm. that's the biggest one. But I do agree, I think there has been an imbalance over the last couple of decades really uh, that's not to say that Royal Ascot isn't a big seller for us because it is the Derby I'm sorry to say less so maybe you know you can get onto John Warren and reach for the moon and, and, and help uh, in that regard but <laughs> there is definitely work to be done and I think that, you know but this is about a balance the Punchtown Festival is one of the major mm. jumping festivals of the year there's no doubt about that no doubt about that but of course it, it, it's Guinea's weekend this weekend too so there should be some balance. Chicken and egg, isn't it? What what came first? You know, is it the is it a section of the media? Are we to blame? Are we to blame for promoting jump racing because the festivals have been better packaged in the spring at the expense of of the flat, and therefore have we generated interest in it? I, I think we have, uh, and I think also talking earlier about the seven bally you know i'm uh, seven bally doors seven the Derby, the whatever, 13, yeah. th th that was on the first that was on the day of the first all premier league saturday champions league final uh i think it was was it liverpool spurs yeah. or whoever it was and selling the derby that year to the the sports desk at reach plc if reach plc existed then but certainly the daily mirror was a waste yeah. of time. It wasn't even worth the cost of the call, and that's a, that's a sad thing. But now, <laughs> a, and one thing that jump racing, a, a, a potential issue with jump racing, is the the, the dominance of Willie Mullins. Mm. Is, exactly. is that, is that go, and, and this the, this glut of odds on favourites at at the big meetings? Is that going to make it a less compelling? issue? It's not a slight against Willie Mullins. Mm. Any trainer I, or win the race, they can. I just think they they should have had more. I'm not saying stop punch, I'm saying integrate it, and then maybe people will get more interest in the flat. Try and pull some people over to get them. Mm. You know, it's, it's our big starting point. It's a big showcase. Mm. It's, 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 it was fantastic racing. There were loads of people there yesterday. It is also the, the lifeblood, yeah. literally and metaphorically, exactly. of the industry. Exactly, and I think we just need to be showing, especially our industry paper mm. needs to put more in. Uh, we talk about Punchestown, but it leads us on, I mean, to, to Willie Mullins, because he has dominated, and Punchestown is five mm. days. He has said, well, he's not sure about Cheltenham going five days. His his own ambivalence is is not exactly a ringing endorsement for that, that concept. Uh, I think um, for... It wouldn't be my preference. I don't... I think four days of great racing is better than five days with some mediocre races, mm. generally. Um, you know, they already have conditional races and amateur races and you know and I know they're very traditional some of those amateur races but I think then that I really believe that four days is enough yeah and we've we've debated and discussed this ad nauseum on this show and people will be saying please park it now uh, but the consultation process is now in full swing Dave and the fact is you've got the preeminent trainer of his generation and the preeminent Cheltenham trainer saying yeah not really that fussed about it. No, he said it's inevitable from an accountant's point of view. Mm. Um, it's certainly inevitable in the short term from an accountant's point of view. Whether that accountant looking 10, 20, 30 years down the line would think a less compelling, essentially watered down 
I don't want to use the word Olympics of jump racing, but it, but it's it, it it's pre it's but you premier, just did. it's premier festival. Thank you. Um, whether whether that is in uh, the for the whether that's for the long term good of the sport, I think is certainly uh, a moot point. Uh, there were contributions from uh, Sir A.P. McCoy, I think, at the start mm. of this week as well. Um, it, it's obviously something that most people, uh, outside uh, those who uh, who want more races to win, I think that it's pretty clear what where yeah. the public opinion lies with regard to a five-day festival. At this stage. Let's move on uh, to the Hall of Fame. Two new inductees this week, Frankie Vittori and Dancing Brave uh, were the two. Um, we're getting them in slowly but, but surely. Eve, conceptually, do you like the idea of a Hall of Fame? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Hmm. It's a great idea. I think they probably need to sharpen it up a bit. You know, it's, as you say, it's taken quite a long time and there's quite a lot of amazing horses and amazing people that could be in there. I think when it gets to the good bit is when people who are currently in operation but have been going yeah. for say 20, 25 years yeah. we're debating, you know, right are we going to put in Eve Johnson Horton or are we going to put in David Yates for example yeah. and that's when you generate the debate <laughs> as to who goes in. Is it going to be Gosden or Stout this yeah. year? Is it going yeah, to be... exactly. But it's sort of taking... Maybe they should have put the baseline in more people to start with the baseline and then they could have... Do you see what I mean? I do see what you mean, um, and it's a, something I've discussed quite a bit with Rod Street. What I, I do love, and I know you will be with me on this, Dave, is the fact that in partnership with the National Horse Racing Museum, there is now a physical manifestation of this Hall of Fame as well, and we're sort of getting to a situation where we might be able to replicate something like there is in Saratoga. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think a, you know, a, a physical manifestation is a very important thing. Um, in terms of that idea that you've just spoken about, sort of so and so versus so and so, is that is there scope? Is there scope for that to be part of a public vote or something like that, whereby you I do think, engage? Yeah, I think you know, a vote, whether it's a public uh, vote or a our Saturday nights on television vote. are all about public votes, aren't mm. they? For whether it's dancing or uh, you know whatever else goes on. I don't. I don't watch there, those. Programs there was a public vote, wasn't there, to get Deja in? I think. Right. Okay. Where they, they they opened that up to the public. I, I just like also. I think that the fact that it, it's about the modern age. Yes, that's fine, and I, I completely agree. I think it's an excellent idea. But there are so many compelling stories from the past. You know, obviously the the, the, the Victorian jock is the the influx of American riders who revolutionised the sport and then got chucked out in disgrace. The 1913 Derby was written about a lot in uh, on its centenary. Uh, there are so many amazing stories. Um, Florence Nagel in 1965 taking the jockey club to court for her right, a female trainer's right, to have the licence in her own name. Yeah, that's really? somebody who should definitely exactly. these, yeah. are, these are amazing, compelling, and really relevant stories. That Florence Nagel story is an amazing one. It was, it was the one case in three years of studying the law that actually uh, caught my interest. Um, I, for one, really enjoyed the documentary you did for Racing TV on Fred Archer. Right, Fred, Do you think you might, and obviously he would be a candidate, well, he would be a shoo-in, yeah. would you consider doing something similar on the Florence Nagel story? Of course, of course. So the, the American, the, American uh, the, the story of the American jockeys at the end of the 19th century is incredible, and I urge anyone listening now to look it up online. And, and the, there's a lot of, Todd of Sloan, great Willie Sims. stories like that Amazing. that we should celebrate again and yeah. really yeah. dig into I think. Well is the popularity of racing now is nothing without context mm. to, to set it against. You were at Ascot on Wednesday on Cigarro Stakes Day. I was. You were. There was quite a controversial stewards inquiry we had the the winner interfering with the third in the Cigarro. Uh, if the winner had been demoted the second horse would have got the race. Rather similar to the Bet365 Gold Cup of Sandown of the previous season where yeah. the winner was the squad. What's your what was your position on on that? It's always been that if you interfere with a horse, you finish behind the horse you interfered with. If you have improved your if position you improve, at, you know, at that horse's expense. Exactly. So there is always going to be a controversy that um, if, if that horse finishes third, you're only improving it. But you have improved... If you've um, significantly interfered with them, and they, I mean, maybe they would have been for second. Maybe they would have won. So why should they be, uh, be to their detriment? So... Uh, I mean, it so would you have chucked her out? No. You wouldn't that, have chucked her out? Not in that particular 
race. I don't think that there was that significant an improvement. Okay. But I can see why it would happen. But you would have been, if you felt that the third place horse would 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 have won yes. or could have won, won yes. uh, had yes. it not been for that improvement, you'd have been happy for the second horse to have been awarded the race. Yeah. Yeah. Dave? Yeah. My answer is slightly different, but it's just based on a slightly different interpretation of of what I saw in the race. As you say, the, the Bet365 Gold Cup, Enrilo stopped Kitty's light in uh, in the run and the race was awarded to Potterman. It seems a weird thing, but it's but the rule is a good one, uh, in my belief. And I, I think that Enemy was, was the horse on the rail who couldn't get through. Uh, it, it would have obviously been a... Um, a, in some ways, a, an unpopular decision to chuck out Princess Zoe. My reading of it was that was the enemy was was severely hampered in that um, example on Wednesday. And, and might, might, the, the key question in the rules is: Might enemy have won? I, I think so, and therefore, therefore. Quickthorn would have won the race. But hmm. but we're just we're looking yeah. we're agreeing about the rule yeah. and about how to interpret just it. Interpret we're just, just interpret having a difference. Yeah. Of opinion to be honest, I didn't really have a good look at the race, so I, I'm sort of. Coming in a bit blind, but I'm agreeing with the rule. Right, Living Legend was the winner of the Group Two Jockey Club Stakes, Dave, on Friday, beating your beer. We've talked about that. Yeah. it's a good story. This it is a very good story. This it's a, um, the, the the Guineas meeting was extended to three days for the the, the first time I think since 2003 Correct. to three days, yeah. and um, we had small fields uh, for uh, the Friday, but. This was a, a heartwarming story. A horse who had 842 days off with, I think, tendon problems, was essentially retired, uh, then was brought back into training. This year has proved better than ever. Uh, won, what, the Magnolia Stakes at Kempton, then a, a big pot on mm. offer for the Easter Classic at Newcastle, and then, of course, defeats Yearbeer to win the Jockey Club Stakes. It, I just think it's a... Th these are... R really incredible stories about horses that their train their trainer and, and uh, we should mention Barbara Richmond, the owner, has her husband Alec. It's the best horse. He's the best horse that they've had. Will go to the Coronation Cup. It reminded me. It reminded me again talking about racing history that um, Rubio, the winner of the 1908 Grand National, was was so badly injured that he was taken out of training and pulled the guests bus uh, of the Saracens Head <laughs> Hotel in. Toaster. Is that right? Yeah. And then was put back into training and then became the first American bred horse to win wow. the Grand National. So the, 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 the amazing thing, and Eve would know so much more about this than I would, but about the, the, the ability of the thoroughbred to come back and, and, and thrive as, as Living Legend has done. Yeah, it's all about time. Time is the only thing that heals. And he had a leg, I believe, mm. tendon injury, and 841 days, what's that, three years? Near enough? Two and, years, and a half, yeah. two and a half years. Um, you know, it's time. And he was given the time and suddenly he went, oh, he's sparking up and why not? Because he's got no miles on the clock. Yeah. It's so, great. So you cannot rush a tendon injury. It can't is just leave them, leave yeah. them, leave them, leave them. Mm. And so even then they might not come back, but it's all time. Well done to Mark Johnston and Charlie Johnston mm. Brilliant and all the, team, all the team associated with Living Legend to get him back. Uh, Shariar is one of a number of high-profile international contenders who are entered for Royal Ascot, it was announced this week. He is currently the favourite for the Prince of Wales Estates, having won the Dubai Shima Classic. A Japanese key horse at Royal Ascot to add to representatives from Australia and the United States and all across Europe, of course. Truly, Eve, this is becoming something quite special in terms of the, the, the biggest profile horses from the east as well as the west coming to Ascot. Fantastic. It's, it's all about international competition, isn't it? And, it's, and, that, and that's what's great about Royal Ascot. It's fantastic getting them here. And the Japanese are really strong, aren't they? I mean, they were brilliant in Dubai. They are just winning everything, which is great. Um, why do you think it is? I think they, they're breeding. They're buying a lot. They bought a lot about 20 years ago. And their breeding is getting better and better and better. And mm. Japanese bred horses are very good. And, and to, to your point earlier on, when we were talking about Caribus and the Derby, yeah. and uh, they, they are, are happy to breed horses who will gallop long and yep. hard. Yep, they like stairs over there. It's going to be um, a key news story for the week, isn't it? The presence of Japan and Australia at Royal Ascot. Yeah, it definitely will be. I mean, we're used to... Australians winning at Royal Ascot would not be... 
a new mm. thing. But uh, they've been away for a yeah, while. Yes, mm-hmm. they have, yeah. Um, it would be a relatively new thing, wouldn't it, for, for American horses? And there are... There are um, well, not the two-year-olds. Not, had not the no, two-year-olds. Yes, sorry, the old, but the old, the old yes, horses. Of course, the older horses. We had Tep in, didn't we? Yeah. Mm. She yeah. sort of stands out. Yeah. Um, we've got... Uh, Andrew Motion's got an entry. Brad Cox, I think, as well. Graham so, Motion. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Graham Motion. Sorry, Andrew Motion was the Prince of Stargo. Poet Laureate. Yeah. Um, um, yes, it, it's it's um, there are new facets to that. As we've had Japanese runners, Deirdre ran at, at, in the Prince of Wales and yep. had and won the Nassau Stakes. Yeah, the day in the sun uh, at Glorious Goodwood. So yeah, it's a it's a, a really fascinating uh, new aspect to what is already an international picture. The fact that that Japanese, American, older horses uh, might show to the fore this summer. Andrew Morton, the um, Andrew Morton, Diana biographer. Sorry, Andrew Motion. Wrong on both <laughs> counts. <laughs> Andrew, oh dear, poet laureate, yeah. Yes, yeah. John right. Warren told me that. Yeah, it's right, going well, this small <laughs> small fields at Newmarket on Friday afternoon, uh, and yes, those races you would quite often associate with having small fields, the Jockey Club Stakes, and and so on. There was a reason, and Amy Starkey, the managing director of Jockey Club East, said it on the show yesterday, in that the bigger field races were moved to Saturday to support the Guineas um, so that the world pool was well-stuffed with runners. Dave, do you like that? Um, Well, you'd rather have bigger fields throughout the three days Mm. or the Friday, he said, stating the beating obvious. But... um, in terms of there are certain pattern races that will never yeah, have of course. Mm. yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I, th- I think that's a uh, that's a good idea if if you're going to um, it, world pool betting was launched here in uh, last last month and it's it, it's obvious that for the yesterday was a world pool betting day so you need decent sized fields to stand that up mm. and if there is a danger which there clearly was that that would be compromised or derailed by having small fields on the Saturday, then it's the right and proper thing to do to put those races on the Friday, which is not a World Pool betting day. Unfortunately, in the perfect world, you wouldn't need to do that. We don't live in a perfect world, and so I think it was the right thing. Yeah, the industry's being asked to get behind World Pool Eve at a time of oh, uh, brilliant, financial, financial difficulty. Um, at what point do you think people will start saying, well, hang on, tail wags dog here. If we get to a day when there's a, a really big race and we have to shift that to a Friday because... Yeah, that wouldn't be ideal. But I think you're quite right that, you know, there are some pattern races that will never fill. Um, but they put the the sprint that Jumby ran in, that was a 100 grand sprint. Mm. Uh, it filled. The yeah. seven furlong race the day before was worth half the money. Now, I probably should have run him in the seven furlong race, but I thought, I'm going to run him in the 100 grand race. And that, it's, it's very simple. Mm. Put the prize money on, the races will fill. And the idea being that if you're generating yeah. more money from Whirlpool, then you can put yeah. prize money on that yeah. day. And that, uh, that's interesting that that entirely affected your Absolutely decision. Absolutely entirely affected. And I probably, he probably would have won the seven fell away, so therefore maybe I'm a fool. Maybe I should have gone for that. But there was, you know, there was a hundred grand pot there. But if he jumped out of the stalls, Stools. he'd exactly. have nearly won your hundred grand. I know, so there you go. But that's, that's um, yeah, that's why. He hasn't been talking to accidental agent, has he? Obviously. And then he's discussing, so discuss, discuss, discuss clearly that bad training, I'd say. I must, must sort them out a bit better. I, on, a, on a serious point, actually, if you do get one, I mean, he, accidental agent is a bad example, because that's. But, but if you get one who's just tardy away, to what? How much can you do at home to get um, them quicker? You can try and try them with a the hood, try and jump them with a the hood, so they they learn that when the hood comes off, they jump. But then you uh, are okay. you with tar- a blindfold. Yeah. 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 Sorry, blindfold. So and try and. And, and that's how you can try and improve their gait speed. And how often have you found it's worked? A uh, couple of times, and then a couple of times that some of them say they're just going, no, thank you. <laughs> I'll just wait a bit longer, thank you. But yeah, it's um, definitely helped accidental agent. So his jump- he started. He doesn't have a uh, he doesn't have a blindfold on now, but that's how we started getting him jumping okay. properly. And is J- uh, is Jumby going to get the remedial now? Possibly, or we'll just go up to seven. Okay. Um, Scandinavian riders. We, we spoke about this a little bit last week. They were on strike because of the new punitive regulations as regards what they were able to do to encourage horses. And this is, extends further than simply not being able to use the whip 
for encouragement, Dave. And there has been an effort to harmonise all the Scandinavian rules between uh, Sweden, Norway and, and Denmark. And we've reached a point where uh, racing is beginning to look very different. Yeah, so are we, are we going to show these? Are we allowed we, to show we these? We are, clips? absolutely, right. yeah. And um, we're going to be t talking to Scandinavian journalist Zander Brett in a moment as right. well. I mean, the, there's, there's a... My view about uh, horse racing being an activity that is there to define champions and, it's, and we define them using ethical means. In my opinion, the Prokush whip is, is within the boundary of those ethical means. Now, in Scandinavia, we'll have a look at the videos whereby initially the, the reins are used to, to hit the horse's neck and then a farcical situation where, um, where the jockeys, they're not riding out with hands and heels. You, you think there's a circuit to go. Sorry, I was doing that as if I've oh. ever ridden a horse. Lucky was about to point that out. Well, um, <laughs> but in terms, an important thing with this, in world pool betting that we've just talked about, you talked to, talk to Ryan Moore about uh, who has ridden with distinction in Japan and in Hong Kong and ask him what he thinks... Uh, the the punters who are who are funding world pool betting asking what 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 their how much they will wager on races that look like the ones we're about to watch because anybody who thinks that world pool betting is the answer to british racing's financial woes chuck out the pro kush whip watch that and you're living in cloud cuckoo land okay i'm going to bring eve on this uh, in a minute, when we when we get Zander on the on the line, which he will, uh, so hold that thought for the moment. Those were this week's talking points.